days ago. We'll be back here again in Quebec. In the epistle for the Mass of this first Sunday of Advent from last Sunday, taken from the book of Romans, St. Paul's of the Romans, chapter 13. No, no, brethren, knowing that it is now the hour for us to rise from sleep, for now salvation is nearer than when we came to believe. The night is past, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and impurities, not in contention and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Gospel, taking that according to St. Luke chapter 21. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations, by reason of the confusion of the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. When he spoke to them of a similitude, see the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth their fruit, you know that summer is nigh. And so you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Men, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's for the words of today's holy gospel. Amen. The first Sunday of Advent for the fourth repetition of the 24th Sunday after Pentecost and preparing for the coming of our Lord at the second coming. He's going to come to judge living and the dead. And the short passage of the Gospel is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, his version of St. Matthew. Remember the synoptics are very similar one to another about what will come at the end of the world. Only a part of it is there. And that there will be signs in the sun and the, and the stars, and know that your redemption is at hand. And so a few considerations <clears throat> taken from Cornelius Alapide and from St. Augustine, Saint Theophilus, and Theophilus, and uh, St. Gregory the Great. And Saint, so you hear from Saint, for Cornelius Alapide, he discusses, you know, the, he is a great Jesuit commentator on sacred scripture, and he discusses, of course, the signs of the end of the world in his commentary on the Gospel of St. Matthew. St. Luke, it's the same thing repeated, that uh, what's going to happen. So in the consideration of St. Luke, considers rather, what are the virtues? What is, the situa what, is the, what is required of the people who are going to be at this time? What should be in their hearts? And what should be in the good souls that are going to see these signs? Because obviously our Lord gives the signs. You'll see the distress of nations. You'll see one kingdom rise up against another kingdom. There'll be disturbances of the waves, disturbances in the seas, such as tsunamis. There will be earthquakes, great earthquakes. All these things have happened in recent times. And there will be one nation rising against the other, and Jerusalem shall be surrounded. You shall see Jerusalem surrounded. And when Jerusalem is surrounded, know that your king, that the, the end is near. That the time of the judgment, the time of redemption is near. And Jerusalem can be considered in two ways, of course, a physical Jerusalem. And it's interesting now, just as last week, learning that <coughs> Trump has decided to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem, and they're going to try to make Jerusalem the capital again uh, of Israel. And this, of course, is prophesied that the temple, with this prophesied, the temple will be rebuilt before the end of the world, even though the Muslims are trying to prevent it. And you have Muslims and, and Christians and Jews all together in a place at the Temple Mount, all fighting over the city of Jerusalem. And now the America comes in with its power, and these all are signs of prophecies about the end times. That Jerusalem's wall will be rebuilt, that the temple will be rebuilt, and this will cause a great uh, reaction, particularly of the Muslims. And we may actually physically see Jerusalem surrounded again, like it says in the Gospel of St. Luke. Excerpt of the passage is taken in the Gospel today, but just before it, it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, and then it says you'll see signs in the sun and the moon and so on. 
But also it says earlier on, what, what Saint Gregory the Great comments on, and uh, Saint Augustine and uh, uh, Theophilus, one of the fathers of the church, he said, they say that, that our Lord says there that towards the beginning, you're going to see all these terrible things happen. And you shall be hated by all men for my name's sake. But a hair of your head shall not perish. In your patience you shall possess your souls. St. Matthew says that they shall not touch a hair of your head. And then St. Saint, Saint Luke says that they are not a hair of your head shall perish. And, in, and that, and that in your patience you shall possess your souls. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed about with an army, then know that the desolation thereof is at hand. And so we consider Jerusalem compassed with an army. It can be the, the church compassed with an army. The church is surrounded on all sides. The New Jerusalem, the Catholic Church, is surrounded on all sides. And it is ready, the people are more and more ready for a persecution of the church. We see a hatred of the church more and more in the world today. And that there is a hatred of the church and a readiness to destroy the Catholic Church. Even the modernist church is getting closer and closer. Because everyone knows, all pagans know, all Protestants know, all atheists know, they all know that the Catholic Church is the true church. The only ones who don't know it are the members of the Catholic Church. But all the enemies know, and they hate the church because it's the true church. They hate the church because it's founded by Christ, and they have been surrounding it and surrounding it and surrounding it for years. And then there's the actual city of Jerusalem itself, which may end up finding itself physically being surrounded again, like it was back in the year 68 AD by the Romans. And so, in your patience, you shall possess your souls. St. So Gregory the Great says, this is the main virtue. The principal virtue that we have to have in the great time of battle is patience. And patience, it is a strange virtue. Not like a lot of not other ones. For instance, in the sermon, in one sermon of, uh, of uh, St. Uh, Augustine, he says, my children, I'm going to preach you up today about the virtue of patience. But I can teach you nothing unless you're patient. Because it's a virtue which you can't even begin to practice and learn about unless you practice it. Patience is a, is a virtue that somehow is mixed amongst all the other virtues. When you learn how to swim, you read a book on swimming, you watch people swim, then one day you jump in the water. But patience is not that way. When you learn how to go to battle, you learn how to use weapons, and then you, you, you learn how to sh shoot at targets, and then one day you go and shoot at the enemy. But patience is not that way. Patience is somehow a virtue that St. Augustine says it's the guardian. It's the guardian of all the virtues. Like humility is on one side, the foundation of all the virtues, and that's at the bottom. And patience is somehow like the air. It's the air surrounding all the virtues. The patience is somehow must be in every other virtue. And then if it's not there, then the other virtues are not virtues. Patience must be found in prudence. Patience is found especially in charity, which is, of course, again, every single virtue. It's the crowning of charity, which is why it's in every single virtue. But patience is the virtue that must be seen in this time. The virtue of patience. We're in a great battle, and one of the, uh, one of the causes of patience, what causes patience? Three things. Faith, hope, and charity. <coughs> Faith, hope, and charity cause patience. Faith is a vision of things unseen. And one day I'm going to see them. So if I have faith, I know that I'm going to see God face to face. I know that his word is true. <coughs> but I don't see all the details of the evidence. And when someone attacks it, I must have patience and wait for it to show itself. And then there is hope which is the cause of patience. Because in the, we, we, we want to attain heaven, we want to overcome the attacks of the enemy, we want to grow in virtue, and we want to become stronger, but these things will happen in the future, provided we persevere now in patience. And then the reason why the, the virtue of patience shows itself as a principal virtue of the saints, it is the evidence of charity, is the proof of charity. Without patience, without charity, there is no patience. 
And so patience comes at the end of charity. Now we're in the final fight. The devil's coming to bring the soul to hell. The God, God is with his angels coming to bring the soul to heaven. We're in the great fight. There is distress of nations. There is earthquakes. There is false prophets. There is liars on all sides. There is every manner of evil. And every conceivable sin is around us. And all manner of heresies are summed together, as St. Pius X says, in the one heresy of modernism. The synthesis and collection and grand sewer of all heresies all pulled together in one. And so we are really literally being buffeted upon every side. And here again, the opposite side of it. What's the opposite of patience? St. Gregory says it's in the next verse of the Gospel after the, ma after the, the Mass today, the, uh, the, or rather the first Sunday of Advent a few days ago. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The next verse of the Gospel of St. Luke, verse 34, the chapter 21. And take heed to yourselves, lest perhaps your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day shall come upon you suddenly. He just pointed all the warnings. You see all the signs. When you see the, 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 the leaves turn, and when you see the figs getting ready to give their fruit, know that summer is nigh. So we see all these signs. And we often see these signs. Even pagans see these signs. They know that we're heading towards dire times. They know that there's hard times ahead. They know that God's judgment is coming. We even see it in Hollywood. We even see it in the stories of modern man. They're all stories of some kind of foreboding judgment coming upon us. And yet, no one's ready. We know there's a judgment. For instance, you have your, your, your phone, and you know that you're being spied on. But then you're shocked that you're being spied on. So we have all the evidence that we're being spied on. Look up and see the chemtrails. Look down and see the garbage in your phone. Listen to the, to the statements of the government. Look at the new laws. And we see the world is turning more and more against God. So there are signs everywhere. But what does Christ say? And take heed to yourselves, even though we have all these signs, lest perhaps your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and the cares of this life. So we're going to be fighting, worrying about trying to survive. And then we're going to be drunk. Why drunkenness? Bishop Sheen gives two reasons for drunkenness. The first, he says, guys drink because they like the stuff. And girls drink because they don't like something else. So there are two reasons of drinking. One is because it's just a party. And the other is to escape you know, the drunkenness is spread throughout the entire world today. And we can add to drunkenness, remember, drugs. All the ways in which to destroy your mind and take away the cares and worries of your mind. This cause of drunkenness that our Lord is speaking of here, drunkenness will spread and drugs will spread at the end of times. Because man will be worried, but he doesn't want to take the answer to the worries, so he turns to drugs he turns to drunkenness. He turns to a kind of drunkenness which are distractions. You know that one of the reasons why we like to watch football all the time, and we like to watch movies all the time, and we like to listen to music all the time, it is a form of drunkenness. It is a way of drinking or getting our mind turned away from reason, turned away from thinking. Because it tells us in the sacred scripture in that psalm we sing on Sunday night, and the monks sing every night at Compline by the caress of St. Benedict. In cubilibus vestris comum gemini. In your bedrooms. In your bedrooms. In the silence of your bedrooms. Because you couldn't imagine noise in those days in bedrooms. That's been solved in our 20th century and 21st century. You're going to, with compunction of heart, think of the things of, think of, the things of God. But that's going to cause souls to go to repentance. So we're going to fight to stay alive, realizing there's no hope. Then there's going to be drunkenness. Drunkenness because we don't really want to take the answer of God and we don't want to think about it. And the third are the cares of this life. The cares of this life. Worrying about paying the bills. Worrying about staying together and are keeping our house. Worrying about survival. Notice as the devil has got, close, got us closer and closer to his takeover. In order to keep us rebelling against him, we're fighting against each other. 
immersed in drugs and, and, and alcohol to, uh, to cover our own guilt and to turn away from the worries of the world. And then, the, and then when we're not drunk, we're worried. Worried about just staying alive. And these three things, what's going to be the result of it? No matter how many times Christ shows the devil is coming, no matter how many times he shows the storm is coming, no matter how many signs there are that wrath of God is upon us, that judgment is near, that we're going to need to repent of our sins, what's going to happen? It shall come upon you suddenly. He gave us all the signs. It's going to come upon us suddenly. What do we do in this crisis? What do we do? And St. Augustine says, Possess your souls in patience. Now, patience is the effect of charity. And the patience is not just to bear things. Very often we think that patience, a man, or St. Paul speaks of wicked patience, when he says, you suffer it when a man slaps your face. If a man slaps your face, you can take it, you're very patient. If you're standing at work, and your job is customer service, and the guy comes and curses at you, and hates your guts, and spits at you, myself is very noticeable in the airports. Extremely noticeable. Before 2001, the airports was a place where businessmen were cursing at the lady behind the counter, cursing at the guy behind the counter. What do you mean the plane's not taking off just because there's a blizzard? i got to get to my destination, and I don't care about the blizzard. And they would curse the agents, and they would be fighting in the airports. They would mock them. But now, and because of the fear of going to jail, everyone's understanding. The airports are so much more virtuous places now. There's love in the airports. There's peace in the airports. Nobody complains in the airports. Oh, I understand. And don't forget about, thank you for your service. Everybody is grateful for being spied on and standing in front of a machine and being looked at by these idiots in the machine and they're trying to look, and they're looking for explosives. And, and, and a lady's, an old lady would put her bag in front of the airport today and they said, what are you doing? We're looking for explosives. Oh, well, thank you. She was very grateful that they were looking for explosives in her purse. And so there, we're in, are, is she the bastion of virtue? Are these ladies bastion of virtues? This patience set is the wicked patience of which St. Paul seeks when he says, you suffer it when a man slaps your face. You can be very patient when a man puts a gun to your head. You can be very patient when you're going to get fired. You can be very patient when you think you're going to die or some great harm is going to call upon, fall upon you. You can be very patient when you think that if you're not, in, if you're not impatient... You won't get the pay raise, you won't get the girl, you won't get the guy, you won't get what you want. This is wicked patience. It is not the patience that comes from charity, which is the love of God. It is a patience that comes from the love of self. Remember St. Paul says, two loves built two cities. No man can live in this life without some patience. Even the most impatient man must take a break from cursing sometimes just to save his throat. He must take a faith from being angry sometimes just so he can build up energy so he can get angry again. So that he has, so that every, even the most angry man cannot be angry at every moment. The most cursing man cannot curse at every moment. The most violent man cannot be violent at every moment. So all experience moments of patience that is bearing wrongs. We will all have to bear wrongs. And St. Gregory the Great says, you can bear wrongs because you can't shoot back yet. And so you are patient, waiting for the time when you can get vengeance. And this is not patience. This is the normal patience. A man says something offensive to you, and you're quiet, because after all, you're, you're very charitable. And so you're very quiet until the time comes when you can stab him in the back, until the time comes when you can get even. Then... You get even. Then you stab in the back. Then you destroy. So this is not patience. And our Lord, in the, in the same 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, where St. Paul speaks about charity. Charity is kind, envieth not. All the different things is seeketh not her own. Seek. Well, he says three times patience. Charity beareth all things. Charity endureth all things. And charity never falleth away. There's three different times referring to the levels of patience. First of all, charity beareth all things. Secondly, charity endureth all things. And lastly, charity never falleth away. 
These are the effects and signs of charity, which are patience. We have to be able to have patience. It says it's an effective ardor. We are on our way to fulfill the law of God. We're on our way to obey, and we're focused on something. Everyone's focused on something. So one example we mentioned from time to time, from the, the uh, Pancrestos, uh, the, the speaking of the uh, sending a young monk, uh, Eastern, Eastern abbot sending a young monk on to, to learn a little bit about, he shouldn't be too worried about flattery. So he said, a young monk, he says, all right, tomorrow I want you to go to the graveyard, and when someone is buried, whoever comes to be buried that day, you mock him and you curse him and you say how bad he was. So he did that. He went to the graveyard. He thought it was, he thought it was going to be a sure he, some, but They brought a body to be buried, and he said, this, this man was straight from hell. The earth will not cover him. He is not a man of peace. He was wicked. He did evil things in his life. So they beat him up. So then he went back to the monastery. He said, all right, tomorrow I want you to go out to the monastery, and when the next person comes, you tell them how wonderful he was. Then they bring the next body in. He says, this guy was great. This guy was wonderful. They're making fun of our uncle. And so they beat him up. And so he had to go back. And then the abbot said to him, well, when you cursed the man who was dead, did he say anything? No. Did he get upset? No. When you went back the next day and you praised the man that was dead, did he get up, did he, was he happy? No. <coughs> so you must be when you experience praise and mockery. This is actually patience. What causes patience? We're focused on something else. When a man is on his way to, the, to, to accomplish something and you try to distract him, the patient man stays focused on where he's going. We're on our way to God. We're on our way to heaven. And, and Theophilus just says, look at this time of tribulation. It's going to be a time of great sorrow for those that are sinners. It's going to be a time of great sorrow because they're going to meet, <coughs> the world is going to meet its judgment and it's going to be a negative judgment. But for the just man, this time shall be a time of joy. That's what he says about the time of the tribulation. It's going to be a time of joy. We're entering into a time of joy. Because we, are, we have Christ, the redemption is at hand, we're living in the state of grace, we're going to the victory, these are all reasons for joy. And since I know I'm going to the victory, and since I know I'm in the army of Christ, and since the redemption is at hand, each day I should have a little more joy in my life, a little more joy in my heart. Now the enemy attacks more and more. Why? Because they're desperate. Because their time is running out. And hence we are not disturbed. So it, it, there, hence the St. Gregory, St. Augustine says, patience is an effect of charity. And the ardor and burning of charity. Because I love God, if I'm attacked, it doesn't disturb me. Patience does not want vengeance upon the other who, who attacked us. And then, of course, patience endureth all things. It makes constancy. Patience makes us steady. That's the point of St. Ignatius in the rule number eight of the first week. In the time of tribulation, persevere in patience. And the tribulation goes away quickly. Don't change direction. Go in the same direction. Put one brick upon another. Put another brick upon another. Maybe the wall seems that it takes a million bricks. Keep building one brick. Next thing you know, the wall is done. Don't get distracted. Don't turn. Don't go away. We keep our faith. Let everyone turn against it. We keep our charity, we keep our hope. Let everyone to say we cannot succeed. Let everyone attack us on all sides, that's fine. Persevere in patience, in the effect of charity, and charity never falleth away, because it has its view on heaven. <coughs> so it's important for us to remember to persevere in our battle, but as St. Augustine says, persevere with joy. Patience causes us to persevere with peace, persevere with joy. Not the natural patience by which we just tolerate what comes around us. And as we're in this great battle, and the, the Christ is about to come and give his victory, the devil is trying to disturb us, we must persevere in patience, and they will not hurt a hair of your head, says St. Matthew. Not a hair of your head shall perish. And then St. Augustine says, yes, your, not, uh, the, 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 not a pair of your head will perish is a reminder of the general resurrection that our bodies are going to be brought back to life and we will not be deformed and he says a guy who's missing one hair is deformed so bald people are deformed according to St. Augustine so if you're missing one hair you are deformed so we will have all the number of hair but then he says not all the length it means you got to get a haircut 
So you will have well, the number of hair, but not the length of hair. So, and also notice this about the hair. Why does he speak of the hair? Because before that, he said there will be great tribulations, there will be great mourning, there will be great sufferings of nations. There will be suffering everywhere. For we know when you take a stick and you hit someone in the, in the body, it hurts them. If you take a sword and cut off his arm, it hurts them. But if you get a haircut, there's no pain. And therefore, through the just, they will, they will receive it to, to receive a punishment of martyrdom, like happened to the martyrs, or to receive the attack of the enemy, to be spit upon and mocked, it's like getting a haircut. There will be no pain for the just. And therefore, they, and also, but also he's trying to comfort the just, because he says there will be tribulations. Beware of your bearing children in those days. But there shall be joy and there shall be a preservation. He even speaks about it. And during the time of tribulation, some will stand before the Son of God, the Son of Man, and shall escape these things. And if you so, some will escape these things. So yes, there's going to be a great tribulation. He says, on the one side, all shall be lost. But watch ye therefore praying at all times, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are to come and to stand before the Son of Man. So there will be some that escape. Our Lord always gives hope in the midst of the great battle. All this tribulation, there's going to be a great tribulation, but there's going to be hope. What do we do during the time of tribulation? Persevere in patience. Consider when they attack us, it's like getting a haircut. You don't get all weepy because your hair is on the floor. You don't get all disturbed because the hair has been cut. You know that it will grow back. It also says St. Augustine, you'll know that you will not lose one of them. And whichever one falls out, it shall be put back. <coughs> on the general judgment, when, when we rise from the dead, every single hair shall be put back into its place. And God speaks literally when he says the hairs of our head are numbered. Each of us has a perfect number of hairs. And we shall not have one less, nor one more, on the day of the judgment, on the day of the resurrection, and that, we, and that we will consider all the pain that we've experienced in this life like getting a haircut. And so it will actually not be pain. There, God is always going to give comfort to those that, per, that follow him and remain faithful to him. And hence he says, The men and men I say to you, not one bit of your hair shall perish. And he goes further. In, in regard to the Matthew, he says, They shall not touch a hair of your head. They shall not touch a hair of your head means that sometimes when they want to attack you, God will not allow it. Not a hair shall perish means that there, we are going to rise from the dead and every, even if we lost our arms, we lost our, our, our whatever was cut out or damaged in us by the enemies, it shall all be put back with absolute perfection. And since we shall lose nothing, not even a single hair, therefore we should rejoice. And then St. Gregory speaks of, a, uh, uh, speaks of an abbot, Stephen, whom he saw go to heaven. And he says, how did he show his patience? Whenever he was attacked and spit and mocked, abbot Stephen gave thanks. He gave thanks whenever he was attacked. And then when, whenever he lost anything, he always considered it a gain. So if he lost money, if he lost possessions, if he lost reputation, if he lost some monkeys, I have gained something. And also, he considered all his adversaries and all his enemies as his helpers. And these are the three causes, of three fruits or three causes of patience. That when we are attacked, give thanks. When we have a loss, then consider it a gain. <coughs> and when we, are, when we have enemies, consider them as our helpers. And then when he died, St. Gregory saw the angels come down and pick up the body of Abbot Stephen and carry him in a special way to heaven. And he learned it was because of his great patience. Because patience does not only tolerate an evil. That's just receiving something. If you are tied down and then someone hits you in the face, you will tolerate it. If you are tied to a stake and burnt to death, you will tolerate it. There's no virtue in toleration by itself. The virtue of patience is coming from charity. Why? Because I love God. And if they want to take away my health, as they did with St. Stephen, he was, he was happy. If they want to take away my reputation in the world, then we are happy. If they want to take away our limbs, we are happy. Because we are focused only on Christ and on the love of God. And therefore we're not disturbed if we lose secondary things. Hence, patience is rightly called a virtue. It's something we do. It's in the strength of our heart. It's an effect of the divine charity that must be inside of us. And whenever the canonization of saints is done, always the principal check of heroic virtue is patience. 
Do they love their enemies? Do they do good to those that hate them? Do they get not overly disturbed when they're spit and accursed on all sides? Do they not react too negatively or negatively to a physical and spiritual ailments that come their way? And so these are the signs of perfect charity. And not only that, rejoicing. Rejoicing like Abbot Stephen. And so we can acquire patience, but it requires activity on our part. And the, and the focus on the goal of heaven and, and, and realizing that it is a fruit of the faith, hope, and charity, the principle of the spiritual life. And it's, it's the, 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 uh, the, the guardian of the entirety of the spiritual life, says St. Augustine. And it's what we, it is one hallmark virtue that must be had in the time of the Great Tribulation, which is why Christ speaks of it well, in the Gospel of St. Matthew and also here in St. Luke during the time of the Tribulation. Those who God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.